minds, um, thoughts that normally came into our heads are it's something about IT um, involving data, statistics, algorithms, dashboards, but um, do we really understand the big why? I mean, why business organizations nowadays need BDA? Because there's rise in data, there's many, many data available, technologies such as RFID and apps in our smartphone, smartphones, as well as the increasing use of social media normally um, resulting in a re rapid rise in data volume. And then um, a changing world. The devices around you now can hear you. Having a conversation about something with a friend, then a few hours later, the ads about it popped up in your social media or web browser. It does happen to you, right? And then um, cheap technologies, uh, I would say there's a lot of um, availability of open source uh, database, web crawlers, etc. And then um, a business application also, for example, um, strategize a marketing based on human behavior rather than the product. So um, business organ organizations normally need uh, BDA because they are searching uh, for answers to meet more challenges. And these challenges are to be overcome by an automated actions based on trusted insights. So as you see, uh, nowadays business, they are um, searching for answers like, uh, I need to increase productivity. Like um, uh, I want to engage more with my customer more efficiently. And then um, for example, uh, we need to be ready before a disaster happens. So this kind of thing, why business organizations need uh, insights from BDA itself. So from uh, a project perspective, this is uh, my uh, personal experience about the project. At, at a glance, it's actually discovering a patterns, outcome, and forecast from a large data set involving methods and intersection of multiple analysis, statistic applications, and database systems. These patterns, outcome, and forecast were then used as insights for decision-making process. So um, I identified there are five key elements um, in analytics projects, which are we have to identify the problem, the factors and problem statement, and then we have to identify the analysis, analysis analytics approach that we're going to use. And then, of course, identify the data involved. And, and then next will be the visualization, a suitable uh, visualization that we will use um, to present. And then uh, Last but not least is the infrastructure, the readiness of the infrastructure itself. For so my project with one of the mapping agency in Malaysia. So like I mentioned just now, it's about uh, the determine the business case or use case. So for example, here, as you can see, the business case is um, about, uh, uh, we, we, we took an example, it's about mapping planning. And then there's a multiple uh, problem statement, which is um, what is the trend of the land usage activity? And then what is the um, river quality? And then a river, wh where is the river flow and the river direction? And then what is the sentiment analysis? Uh, sentiment analysis meaning something that you get um, from citizens, from social media. So, and then um, another thing is the data relationship and probability itself. And then next part, we go about uh, analysis and analytics approach. Um, for example, for land usage activity, we, we want to see the density, the development of the growth rate, the population uh, for that particular area. And then uh, for the river quality, we, we would like to see on the quality, uh, we would like to analysis on the quality based on the water quality index. And also we want to do prediction to see uh, whether this river quality, how, how would it look like in the next couple of years? And then um, the next uh, for river flow for analysis analytics uh, that we're going to, that we were using is actually analysis of flow direction and speed. So that if let's say at one point when the um, uh, river pollution happens, so where the, where does it go? Which area will, will affect it? That's the purpose of uh, to, to, to do the analysis on the flow and direction. And then um, sentiment analysis is um, from social media mentions. So from there, we get the um, uh, positive, negative, or neutral. So for example, uh, we key in the keywords like um, uh, smelly or polluted river. So that will be negative sentiment. And then when, so when we do uh, our analysis at that time, because normally for social media, it's 
is about current data. So when we do analysis and we combine with the current data or current um, sentiment, then we can match that, oh, this is um, really um, bad things happen and this is re um, the river is really polluted and sort of, yeah. And then um, the percentage um, probability uh, is the percentage probability and prediction is how uh, we combine all the analysis and we uh, all the analysis from all parameters and how it interacts with um, each other. So from this uh, example, actually, uh, the process is uh, the process of getting the data. First of all, we identify the data required from uh, for example, with the problem statement and analysis analytics approach, we identify the data required. For example, you can see there is, um, sorry, you can see here is actually um, topography map, digital terrain model, um, digital surface model, and river map. Mind you, um, about this project is actually involving um, um, involving geospatial data and also uh, river pollution data from uh, um, Jabatan Alam Sekitar. So, and then about the keyword statements and location, we just identify based on uh, suitable scenario. Like for example, now we are doing about um, river pollution. So the keyword statements um, will be related to the, to the pollution itself. And then as part for, and then uh, in terms of uh, managing the data, uh, we use uh, a geospatial uh, software to do the data cleansing and wrangling. So, uh, and then we do the standardization of the data also, like um, we divide, uh, we, are, we have given the area of interest that we, we would like to do the analysis. And then this uh, area is along Sungai Terbrau. Sungai Terbrau is 32 kilometers. So along this Sungai Terbrau, we divide into sub-districts, into four sub-districts. So all the data, um, all the analysis that we're gonna do, we have we will divide into these four sub-districts. So um, for example, when we request for the data, we request the data along Sungai Terbrau. So when we, when we get the data, uh, our data analyst and data engineer will, will uh, divide it accordingly. Follow it, it, it follows the map also. When we receive the map data, also we divide into the sub according. So this is how we standardize um, the data and how we standardize our analysis and analytics. Okay, so my example number two is another uh, different business case. Uh, it is more in different business case and different uh, data. So I would like to highlight that um, it is not, uh, to me, analytics is not one size fits all. So for, for previous example, it's about geospatial data. The approach will be different in terms of you have to, um, still you have to identify the building blocks. The building blocks here are the problem statements. So once you know the problem statement, then you study about the data. So then you will know um, what will be the suitable visualization. So if, uh, for example, like before, uh, the, the previous example, the, the visualization suitable for that is mostly a map charts and KPI charts and heat map also. But for, for um, my example number two, the data mostly are about um, pricing, about complaints, um, about enforcement. So uh, the, the, the nature of the data is different and then the visualization also will be different. Maybe you will, uh, we will use a lot of bar charts and line charts and most of um, the charts are instead of uh, just a map chart. So in, in my uh, example number two, in terms of the data, how we identify uh, the data is uh, like we identified same like just now we identified the data required. We check the availability and then um, the, avail the availability of, of course, um, uh, sometimes there are the data that we want to use, but whether if it's internal or external, uh, meaning internal agency or external agency that we have to identify also because if it's required an external agency then it has to go a formal written process and then um, after that we will do a data inventory and also creating a data catalog um, 
while creating a data catalog, um, it will involve like um, uh, ER diagram. And then after that, uh, we have to um, study because there's a lot of data. Sometimes you have to know what kind of data do you want because in the apps or in the system itself, um, it will be overwhelmed because everything is there. You just have to know a specific data that you need so that you can only pull the data and then um, work with the data. So uh, the data cleansing and wrangling part will be done by um, my uh, data engineer team. Okay, so um, this is a visualization, example of visualization. Um, to me, there are two types of, um, in my project, there are two types of visualization which are static and dynamic. So what is meant by static is actually we are using uh, a stat static data so um for example um we there's a bunch of data that we already clean and um we already um clean for this particular dashboard so we put it in the dashboard and we visualize so it can be um, a map chart a kpi chart or a bar chart so and then um this for example is a bar chart with multiple exists to show the percentage of relationship of multiple variables and its rank. So from here, let me explain a little bit. It's about, um, like I mentioned just now about my previous project, it's about um, river pollution. So um, these are the uh, parameters and land use and pollutants. So parameters, parameters of the river itself. So the dissolved oxygen, the biochemical oxygen, the pH, the ammonia, and that will call parameters. And then land use is the vegetation industry or range residential. So, uh, and then the, uh, this, how we see this relationship um, uh, of these uh, parameters uh, affects the river pollution itself. So from this chart, if you can see the vegetation gives a highest percentage in contributing as a contributing factor to the, to the river pollutions. And then followed by dissolved oxygen, for, uh, and then uh, followed by uh, industry and uh, residential. So it's um, multiple exists. I would say there there are um, two uh, X exists here. As you can see, one is for land use and one is a pollutant. But it all are sort up in a rank. So you can see uh, which one um, when these two uh, parameters um, mix. So which one gives the highest. Um, uh, give the highest percentage, meaning uh, that costs most uh, for the river pollutants itself. Okay, next is uh, I'm, I use uh, the multiple color line chart to show the trend of the river quality over time in a year. So if, as you can see, the color changes, so meaning um, when it becomes red, meaning uh, it's become polluted. So uh, as the line changes, then the category of the river also changes. So you can see the trend at first is slightly polluted and then it become polluted um, and become more polluted. So, and you can see uh, on the left hand side is the category for the river, um, the WPI uh, reading. So polluted meaning zero to 59, 60 to 80 is slightly polluted and then clean is 81 to 100. And then the below here is the line chart for uh, prediction. So when we predict five years onwards, um, the river, I mean in Sumatra Brow, it will be polluted. So this is uh, types, uh, uh, one type for visualization that we are using in our project to show the trend and also uh, to show the uh, trend in historical data and also in prediction. Okay, here is a map chart and pie chart to show the probability and the prediction. So when we do a probability for class prediction, we, uh, we predict that 31.2% um, here, the red color in the, in the pie chart is actually showing uh, uh, the river will be polluted and another 68.8% will be slightly polluted. And this um, table here shows a detail which, uh, which river is considered polluted and which river is considered slightly polluted. 
and then we also use uh, a map chart to visualize uh, better. So um, this is our area of study. So we will show this will show you um, meaning that a Tebrau area will uh, will have um, most polluted river. So the result from the prediction. Um, so the result from the prediction and the probability of the river class um, match with the result of the growth rate and prediction for the land use. So as you can see here, when we predict previously, when we predict when we do the prediction here, we con we concluded that the Brow has the most polluted air, uh, river, and when we match with the current map and also uh, um, this is topography map we call it. So when we when we match with the map, we can see that. In the brow area, um, the, it's a biggest area and also it has uh, multiple uh, land use type, uh, which is residential, industrial and vegetation. All three are present in this brow area. So, and uh, from our prediction for the um, growth rate also, the approximately of 13 to 20% increase for industrial and residential in the brow area. So that hence, it supports our decisions um uh it supports our our result in analytics itself in why we uh, our analytics gets the brow uh will be the most affected area in terms of um, river pollution itself okay that's about the uh static uh data i just would like to share about when we use a dynamic data when it's a real-time data so how the visualization uh you can how the visualizations will be. So this is just an example. Um, when we use a real-time data, so when uh, this will involve an API call and everything from the database, and then uh, in at a specific intervals, the, the dashboards uh, will change. So you can see here, I use a KPI charts and there's a bar chart. So you can see as the time changes, as the data stream uh, going on at, at a given interval, the numbers, um, the value also changes. So this is more on surveillance on, and the historical data are kept to generate the, a suitable algorithm. So normally this kind of um, visualization we use for anomalies detection. Yeah. So this is an example of the reporting that from when I mentioned just now about historical data. So when from the real time, data when we put it into our database so we can keep um, the historical data as a report. So the report will be something like this. So that's like I said uh, earlier that in, in, in every apps and in every system, there's a lot of data, but you have to know what kind of data you want. You might not want every single thing. So that's the importance of for you to identify the problem statements, and identify the building blocks so that you won't be getting um, 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 inaccurate data, meaning that a data that is not useful for you. And also sometimes uh, when we're talking about uh, data, there are sometimes um, uh, the data that you want is, is not is not saying unavailable, but you have to mix. For example, you have to A match with B to get C. So that's an example for that. So in order to get C, we call it a, a data wrangling process. So um, that is why it is important for you to know the problem statement, to know the building blocks first, because um, analytics is not about you. It's not one size fits all. And it's not about um, you. Once you do A, then you can do from, you can do until Z. Meaning no, because if you want to do A, then you only have to do A, then the data only have to be specific to A. I hope you can get what I mean. Okay, now let's move to infrastructure. It is to me is also um, important key in uh, analytics uh, project because uh, the infrastructure plays an important role to support the BGA initiative. This is because um, uh, the infra need to be able to handle um, a very huge and variety of data. Four main points that need to be taken care of in infrastructure is uh, capacity. It, uh, for example, a database and a server. Are there enough space and capacity for the data? Because we don't want, when, when we're talking about big data analytics, for sure it involves um, a lot of data and multiple types of data. So we don't want to be um, in a situation where uh, we don't have enough capacity. 
or um, because um, when we're talking about big data, it makes sense that we need a big capacity. And then the next one is licensing. So for example, for tools and software that we're going to use, for example, visualization tool normally that we use Tableau or Power BI, we, we have to make sure that licensing is there and, and, and also we have to identify is there any specific user group because um, different user groups sometimes uh, there are different um, capabilities. For example, um, user group for viewers, you can only view the dashboard and you can only view the report and you cannot do the analysis and analytics. You cannot do, you cannot uh, put in the data or you cannot um, um, create the visual visualization. So normally the, for the viewers, uh, user group is only for the top management because normally they don't really involve in creating the dashboard but they just uh, want to see the outcome. They just want to see uh, the, the visualization part itself. So um, for the user group uh, analysts, for example, uh, analysts, normally they can, they can play around with the data, they can play around with the um, uh, visualization. And then next is the configuration. So the software configuration needs to be done accordingly. So um, even though it's open source software, but sometimes it requires a lot of configuration, for example, it requires, um, sometimes it requires uh, to do some programming language, some R or Python. So those but also we need to make sure everything is there. And next is system integration. It is, uh, if it involves multiple systems from multiple sources, then a system integration test should be done accordingly at the end of, um, I'm not saying at the end, like after you develop uh, the visualization itself is this is to minimize the cuts when the BDA runs. Okay, so um, that's about infrastructure. Then after that, um, I would say BDA it's um, sort of new to the government especially. So most of government agencies they don't really have a BDA policy yet. So uh, when I involved in one of the projects with the government, so I, our task is also to develop the BDA policy, the BDA policy for them. So there are um, five key policy that, um, that uh, I think um, is very important to, to focus on. First is integrity. Mm -hmm. So the integrity is um, where the stakeholders involved in BDA must have the integrity towards the data analytics approach. And then it's transparency, like the stakeholder involved must aware of the decisions made and on the um, insights game. And then the auditability, um, BDA process flow data and um, involved must be documented because um, in order for them to do the audit in the future. So this is, we must document all the data involved, all the method that we use, the algorithm, the software and everything. And then uh, the standardization. This is very important because uh, to ensure the standardization of BDA in our organization, because we don't want BDA to, to we, we don't want to treat BDA just like a project because once the project's completed, then it ends there. So it's no longer used for anything else. So we don't want that to happen. So that's why this standardization uh, is important. Uh, for example, we set in you know, a policy that uh, for them to um, update the data every two years, or update the, or, or maybe select a different uh, business case after five years. Yeah, so we spell this everything in the BDA policy. And then lastly, it's uh, about change management. So uh, stakeholders should be able to demonstrate um, the findings of BDA and insights gained from it to the top management. This is really important because the decision makers are those um, in top management. So how um, at the analysts, how these um, how these analysts uh, and data scientists um, present to the top management is really really. Okay, now let's move to infrastructure. It is to me is also um, important key in uh, analytics uh, project because uh, the infrastructure plays an important role to support the BGA initiative. This is because um, uh, the infra need to be able to handle. Um, a very huge and variety of data. Four main points that need to be taken care of in infrastructure is uh, capacity. It, uh, for example, a database and a server. Are there enough space and capacity for the data? Because we don't want, when, when we're talking about big data analytics, 
for sure it involves um, a lot of data and multiple types of data. So we don't want to be um, in a situation where uh, we don't have enough capacity or um, because um, when we're talking about big data, it makes sense that we need a big capacity. And then the next one is licensing. So for example, for tools and software that we're going to use, for example, visualization tool, normally that we use Tableau or Power BI, we, we have to make sure that licensing is there and, and, and also we have to identify is there any specific user group because um, different user groups sometimes uh, there are different um, capabilities. For example, um, user group for viewers, you can only view the dashboard and you can only view the report. And you cannot do the analysis and analytics. You cannot do. You cannot uh, put in the data, or you cannot um, um, create the visual visualization. So normally, the, for the viewers, uh, user group is only for the top management because normally they don't really involve in creating the dashboard, but they just uh, wants to see the outcome. They just want to see uh, the the visualization part itself. So um, for the user group uh, analyst, for example. Uh, analysts normally they can they can play around with the data they can play around with the um, uh, visualization and then next is the configuration so the software configuration needs to be done accordingly so um, even though it's open source software but sometimes it requires a lot of configuration for example it requires um, sometimes it requires uh, to do some programming language some R or Python so those but also we need to make sure everything is there and next is system integration it is uh if it involves multiple systems from multiple sources then a system integration test should be done accordingly at the end of um i'm not saying again like after you develop uh the visualization itself is this is to minimize the cuts when the bda runs okay so um that's about infrastructure then after that um i would say bda it's um sort of new to the government especially. So most of government agencies, they don't really have a BDA policy yet. So uh, when I involved in one of the projects with the government, so I, our task is also to develop the BDA policy, the BDA policy for them. So there are um, five key policy that, um, that uh, I think um, is very important to to focus on first is integrity. Mm -hmm. So the integrity is um, where the stakeholders involved in BDA must have the integrity towards the data analytics approach. And then it's transparency, like the stakeholder involved must aware of the decisions made and on the um, insights game. And then the auditability, um, BDA process flow data and um, involved must be documented because um, in order for them to do the audit in the future. So this is we must document all the data involved, all the methods that we use, the algorithm, the software, and everything. And then uh, the standardization. This is very important because uh, to ensure the standardization of BDA in our organization, because we don't want BDA to, to we, we don't want to treat BDA just like a project, because once the project's completed, that it ends there. So it's no longer used for anything else. So we don't want that to happen. So that's why this standardization uh, is important. Uh, for example, we set in you know, a policy that uh, for them to um, update the data every two years or update the, uh, or, or maybe select a different uh, business case after five years. Yeah, so we spell this everything in the BDA policy. And then lastly, it's uh, about change management. So uh, stakeholders should be able to demonstrate um, the findings of BDA and insights gained from it to the top management. This is really important because the decision makers are those um, in top management. So how um, and the analysts, how these um, how these analysts uh, and data scientists um, present to the top management is really really important. Okay, um, I would like to highlight also on my challenges in uh, analytics projects. Uh, there are three areas which are the data the expertise and the change management. So in terms of data, there are three things that, that we need to um, focus on, which is the availability, the readiness, and the openness. When we talk about availability of the data, it means that um, the data required
has been identified, but such data is unavailable. So in this kind of scenario, then meaning maybe we have to change a little bit our analysis. Maybe we have to do a different analysis because um, yeah, there's no data, so no analysis can be done. No analysis can be uh, uh, can can be gained from it. And then another thing is readiness. So readiness is the available data might be require extensive data cleansing and rendering process. Meaning the data is there, but it's not really clean. So you have to do a lot of data cleansing. You have to do a red data wrangling, for example, A plus B to get C. So because the data is there, it's just that um, you have to do something extra to make it useful for your analysis analytics. Because um, on, when you have the right data on, then your analysis analytics will be accurate. Then the openness. Uh, this is uh, I'm, I'm not sure if it's also happened in uh, private sector, but in government sector, this is really um, a crucial thing because when it involves data sharing between agencies or departments, it is uh, not so easy. I would say, um, I mean, every department still have um, their doubts about sharing their data. And sometimes we have to mine on the data security uh, because, uh, of course, we don't want, um, most agencies and departments don't want to expose the data so much. So I think most of data scientists here experience this kind of situation. And then um, next challenges is in expertise, uh, especially in analytics, because um, for government sectors, they don't really have the officers that really well trained uh, in analytics. Um, Mind you that it is not only about algorithms, it is not only about statistics, but it is also finding um, the right building blocks and connecting the dots. So those analytics um, personnel or, or, or officers should, and instead of understand their data, but they also need to know how to connect this data and come out with some useful analytics and these analytics to give a useful insights for decision makers. And then um, next is the change management and I would say the adaptation because um, adaptation, uh, I think at our level, analytics and data scientists, uh, analysts and data scientists understand what analytics is, what it can do to help for the business and organization to grow and, and, and how it helps in decision making. But um, when we present it to the top management, uh, we cannot use jargons that are too technical because because um, most decision makers are in that techie. So we have to explain and show to them uh, how uh, this is our findings and this is uh, based on the, the exact data that we use and, and this is the findings that uh, give this kind of insights. So for example, uh, in my project, um, when we do uh, mapping planning, uh, the, the problem statement is for mapping planning. But why we do analysis on river pollution? Because the logic is river flows, right? So the river flows so from the flow of the river, we can identify uh, which area to be update, which area is safe or which area is not safe. So uh, when explaining this, we, we must avoid using jargon. We, we won't be saying that uh, okay, I use uh, this uh, statistical algorithm to get this kind of result. No, because they won't. It's not like they won't understand, but it's just like it is too technical. So it is important because uh, it is important for them to understand and buy the idea of analytics. Because in the end of the day, they are the one who make decisions. So if um, analytics will make a lot of uh, changes in terms of um, working style. So, for example, in terms of um, mapping update, when they update the map, normally they use, uh, they, they do it uh, three years, five years, or ten years because it's, it's, it's already in their, in their enforcement. It's like that. But when analytics come around, so we want to avoid, like, in a situation where something happened uh, at some particular area, for example, and then they don't have uh, uh, an update data. So, for example, um, when, when, when a disaster, like a river pollution happened in one particular area, and then when, when the authority wants to um, do action, wants to do some analysis, and then when they ask for the updated map, and then this agency don't have that particular 
uh, so we want to avoid that kind of situation. So that's why we have to address um, the importance of analytics and uh, that can help to avoid this kind of um, scenario to happen. So just a little bit about um, project management. So in my project team, uh, I'm, I'm as a project manager. There are three, um, the, the team is divided into three branches, which are the business analysts. Below the business analysts, we have data scientists, data analysts, and data engineer. These people are normally who identify who study the client's data and identify what they can do with the data and how to do the data wrangling process, the data cleansing process, and um, what will be the suitable business case, what will be uh, the suitable objectives. Yeah, so this will be done by the business analyst team. And then we have a solution architect. And then below the solution architect, we have IT engineer, database administrator, and programmer or developer. So these people are um, the one who uh, configure the software, configure the infrastructure, uh, identify the suitable uh, software to be used, and then if, if let's say that it's about um, making or developing apps and uh, where we need a programmer or developer. Also, when it involves coding, for example, in Tableau, when we want to uh, we want to use um, we want to to visualize something that we have to do R, we have to do Python. This is where the the developer involves. And then designer, of course, when you uh, create a dashboard, design is, is really important. So um, sometimes you have you will spend hours just to pick a color. So this is why a designer is really important because we don't want it to look, um, the, 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 the dashboard itself, we want it to look very interesting for people to see. And we want to make sure that, that um, the message that we try to present, uh, meaning our data storytelling from the dashboard itself, um, meet the requirement, meet the audience. So meaning when, when people see the dashboard, they're interested. And from there, they're interested to see and they understand. So this is why we did a suitable design for, for the dashboard itself. Just a little bit also about project implementation process flow. Okay, um, we have, um, for my method, I will use agile development methodology. So, uh, we do a brainstorm design, then develop, and then the quality assurance deployment and deliver to client. So the brainstorm, this is where, where the requirement analysis, where we sit down with client, what they want, uh, what kind of analysis, and then what kind of data required, um, where can we get this kind of data, whether it, it is in the same agency or we have um, to request from an external agency. And then when we go to design phase, this is where we started designing the dashboard. We started uh, with the dashboard. We started to put in the um, a suitable uh, charts, a suitable image, and, uh, um, and um, yeah, suitable visualization purpose and then uh, development phase is where we gather uh, with the clients and uh, the users specifically and we do a demo and from the demo we get the feedback from them and then uh, next phase will be called the assurance um, so this phase where uh, we identify defects and resolve bugs so if there's any uh, problem with the data, there's any problem with the visualization, so we will do what necessary here. And then the deployment, uh, the deployment is we call it go live, uh, go live stage where everything is done and we put everything to the production server, then we publish. So um, after this, uh, before we deliver to client, we do a testing first, so there will be um, user acceptance test, there will be provisional acceptance test, and also there will be final acceptance test. So once the final acceptance test is uh, accepted and everything is fine, then only we deliver to client. But if um, there's still a uh, problem during the deployment, then we will do next iteration and the cycle. Thank you. Uh, I really like the part that you mentioned about the building blocks. I uh, I would like to echo on that and remind everybody its importance. So although this session is uh, 
specifically dedicated for the students. I understand that there are also uh, practitioner, uh, practitioners, so I like to brand my students as junior data scientists. If you have any questions or anybody have any questions, please feel free to ask. Uh, you can use the uh, chat box as well if you're more comfortable to us with uh, textual. Uh, there's one question over there. Uh, please allow me to read it. What are the expectations of people towards your career but differ from the reality? Because your title is the hype versus the realm. Yeah? Uh, very interesting. So this pretty lady at the uh, late night, we somehow came up with the title. So what's the expectations, the clash between the realm and the hype? Okay, um, of course, the expectations is actually uh, when we say that, um, okay, I'm not, uh, I try to relate with data scientists, but even though I'm not a data scientist, I'm a project manager, but the expectations towards me is that uh, people will expect me, uh, okay, what, what algorithm do you use for this kind of scenario? So um, to me, that part will be done by data scientists, but it is a, uh, a clear cut between a data scientist and also the business analyst. So the business analyst here, you should understand the data. You should understand the, the, the client background uh, and what your client do and what do they want. So this is done by, by the um, business analyst. And then uh, when, when everybody understand, then the data scientists and the data analysts will come up with uh, the algorithms. So you cannot ask uh, what algorithm you use to the business analyst or to project manager because they cannot answer that. Yeah, so that's the expectations. So, yes. Uh, so, I imagine in the presentation, you take the whole team to be able to answer all these kinds of questions from many angles, yeah? Yeah. Uh, but hope uh, from the experience, uh, you can answer the next question. Uh, the algorithm being used uh, previously on the uh, prediction of value based on project river pollution, uh, the Q score. Okay, we use hot winter, hot winter for the prediction. Um, and then for, because uh, there are multiple um, problem statements that I shared just now, there are five or four, if I'm not mistaken. So each problem statement, when we have uh, predictions, we use hot winter. So this prediction, we match, uh, we uh, sort of uh, over, overlap all these uh, four results of analytics. And this method we would call random forest method. Right, interesting. Uh, how about the accuracy? The accuracy, uh, the accuracy is about uh, ninety-five percent of accuracy. And right. so how your threshold is always your threshold is above ninety. Yes. So right. how we match that is, um, uh, like I mentioned just now, when we when we predict that interbrow area that will be, uh, the river will be polluted. So we match with the land usage activity there. So when we match with land usage, land usage activity, then we can see that there's a lot of land use activity. For example, there's vegetation, there's residential and, and, and industrial. So that uh, supports our results. Okay. Uh, maybe you can take also the uh, next question. How impactful is the business analysis towards the business and how supportive the government was towards the uh, business analysis? Okay, for question number one, how impactful the business analysis toward the business? This is really, really impactful because, for example, um, I'm talking about uh, uh, when, when, when in government sectors, we look less in terms of uh, profit. We look more in terms of what, what government can give to the citizens, what the government can give to the country. So, for example, um, for example, recently in, when, when it happened, the disaster, um, a pollution in Sumer Kim Kim. So uh, when, when, when they still stick to three, five and ten years of, uh, they call it, uh, I can't remember, but there's, there's uh, some akta lah that they will work uh, based on to update the map in every three years, every five years and every ten years. So when, when, when we don't really have the updated maps there and then the disaster happened, so it's really a problematic for the authorities to do actions, to take some, some precautions. So when, when we bring the analytics in, so we do the predictions. So from there, we can see already which area will be affected in the next couple of years. So before this disaster or pollution happens, so we already 
prepare the what necessary, meaning we already do the map updating now. So if the 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 incident happen in the next couple of years, then we won't be having an issue such as there's no data available, there's no map available. Right. Okay. We can seem to let you go, but perhaps you can show uh, quickly the building blocks that you mentioned from your slide. Uh, so then we can prepare for the next speaker. Uh, there's one question about the uh, building blocks uh, from your slide, maybe. Which one is the building block? Okay, hold on. Um, so, uh, everybody, uh, after this last question, uh, I hope to hold the question to the next presenter or take it to the, uh, to the end uh, so that we can have our next speaker. Okay, so the, build, the building blocks is the problem statement. So from this problem statement... Uh, maybe you need to press present now again, please. Sorry? Would you mind? Uh, you need to press present now again. I, I did already. It doesn't appear. Uh, not to me. How about to, to the rest? Okay, hold on, hold on. See that on the screen? Okay, what about now? Yeah, coming. Good. Right, so this is the building blocks here, everyone. Yeah, so the building blocks I mentioned just now is in this way, in the problem statement. So first, you have to identify the problem statement. Then you work around it. Because if only business case alone, there will be a lot of things. Then you wouldn't know what kind of data you want and you will end up uh, being overwhelmed. So you have to create a problem statement uh, so that you can focus to each of it. Yeah, it's like uh, the whole uh, plan, yeah, the whole plan of the. Yeah.